We got to know Joey about eight years ago, and it's been a wonderful journey for all of us together. Our young people love Joey, our old people love Joey, Amy and I love Joey, and uh, we're glad to have him today. And Joey, we're going to begin, just like we begin every week, by asking you to introduce yourself. So go back to the beginning and give us the three-minute version of the life history of Joey Haynes. Three minutes. Three minutes is all you got. <sighs> I uh, took some bullet point notes to really, you know, keep me on task. Amy did remind me she also has a sermon to talk it or to say, so I need to keep this short. And I also, before I begin, there's nothing more that I hate than waking up early to exercise. I promise 615 basketball will be completely worth it. So please come join me and a few others playing basketball on Friday morning. So thank you all. And uh, I appreciate being here. And I, I just also want to mention that I really appreciate hearing everyone else's stories. I think one of the, the things that I appreciate about actually being at Queens is the opportunity to just sit and hear a lot of different stories from a lot of different people from different places. And so I've appreciated these last few weeks, you know, getting to know some fellow Park Rodians a little better. So thank you all who have shared and um, continue to make this place, I think, the special place that it is. So moving on, I was born and raised in rural West Virginia. Uh, I was actually born in Fairley, West Virginia, which is in Greenbrier County. And I mention this because some of you all might be familiar with the Greenbrier Resort. Uh, the Greenbrier Resort at one place was actually a secret bunker uh, where a lot of politicians from DC were actually sort of meant to go to in case of nuclear war. Um, and so that's usually when I tell people that I'm from that area, they're like, oh, I've heard of the Greenbrier, or I've been to the Greenbrier, or have conferences at the Greenbrier. Um, and so my parents actually uh, were mostly raised in White Sulphur, which is the town that the Greenbrier is in. And I was actually raised in the next county over, Monroe County, which was much more secluded. Um, the whole county, we have no stoplights, no fast food, uh, a lot of cows, a lot of cornfields. Uh, yeah, so born and raised in Monroe County and uh, spent most of my life in, the, in a very rural Pentecostal holiness congregation with um, a lot of my family members as well. Uh, actually, one of those churches, there were a couple of churches that we went to and a few years ago got to take some of the youth to our tiny little um, uh, rural Pentecostal church, which was uh, fun for them to see, and also took them to the house that I was raised in, which uh, it was a house that my grandmother actually was raised in as well, and um, you actually had to walk across a swinging bridge to get to it, so you parked on one side of the creek and then, you know, walk across, and so very West Virginia. Um, <laughs> After moving. West Virginia, what? Move it on. Yeah, after West Virginia, <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, after West Virginia, I ended up actually coming to Queens, uh, which is how I found, you know, came to Charlotte and still here and graduated from Queens University of Charlotte. After I graduated, uh, moved to South Korea for about a year, taught English, came back, was pretty broke, um, needed a job, and that's basically how I found Russ and Amy. Tell us about that first morning. Uh, about eight years ago, we were looking for a youth minister. We had sent out word to all of our friends and Diane Mowry, who was at that time the chaplain at Queens University, texted me back and said, I've got a young man named Joey Haynes, and I don't know whether he would be interested, but he would be great if he would talk to you. So we called Joey, and we decided to meet for breakfast at Chick-fil-A across the street, and that's how it began. So tell us about that conversation. To be honest, I was in fact not very interested. Um, 
at, at, the, at the time and, and place in my life, I was not very interested in church, actually. Um, but I had very little money in my bank account. Um, I intended to sort of stay in Charlotte for one year, and uh, my plan was actually to go to Europe and get my master's. And um, I was looking at you know, ancient Nordic studies in Iceland or nationalism at a school in Hungary, but I just didn't want to stay here. So when I met with Russ and Amy, it was actually, uh, well, I do need a job, and money would probably be helpful. The perfect way to call a youth minister, somebody who's not interested in the church who just needs money. <laughs> and then who would have thought that that hour, two-hour conversation would have probably be, be the most life-changing experience, I think, of my entire life. Um, and I often think back at that our time at Chick-fil-A and in that conversation and I think I don't know how Russ and Amy remember this but I think one of my key takeaways as far as oh wow this is an interesting place that you all work at or church I sort of went through a, a short list of all my concerns and hesitancies with the church capital C church and all of the ways in which I sort of looked at the church and was like it's just not what I, I just am not connecting very well. And went through a long list thinking, there are two pastors at a church. It probably is not gonna go very well for me. And they both looked at me and said, we agree. And that was a pretty instrumental, significant moment, I think, in my life because it was the first time that I, I heard you know, two leaders in a church express doubt, concerns, sort of these, these issues that the church is not addressing, that they're like, yeah, we, we also think that that is true. And so I think just sort of having that affirmation, having that validation of concern that so often I felt like Christians didn't express and these two leaders did, I was like, this is interesting in a different place. And near the end of the conversation, uh, I remember, distinctly remember Amy saying, also, you know, we, we recognize that you were raised in a very different tradition in, uh, in rural West Virginia and the Pentecostal tradition, that, but we do want you to know that we are an open and welcoming and affirming church which means we do allow all people, regardless of um, sexual identity, sexuality, um, and that we actually, in fact, uh, had a same-sex union at Park Road. We just wanna make sure that you are comfortable with that because this is who we are. And I was just flabbergasted. I was like, a church exists that people can come and be who they are, and I was just stunned, and so I think that was that moment that I was like, maybe, maybe I've been a little too harsh on church. It was a great conversation, and uh, it's <clears throat> ironic that we met at Chick-fil-A. Joey has his Starbucks cup, and he's never very far from the Starbucks cup. We should have met for coffee that morning, but it was a, it was a fortuitous meeting. Um, not long after Joey uh, came to be with us, Amy and I had started seeing some things in Joey and thinking, we need to get Joey to seminary. We think this would be a great fit for him. Not only would it be good for him, it would give us five years while he's in school that he could be our youth minister. <laughs> We were, we were interested in this, and one day Joey showed up, before we had the conversation, Joey showed up at Amy's office, and he said, do you have any of these books? And these were all seminary textbooks. And Amy said, why? And tell us why. What's going on? <laughs> um, I mean, it really didn't have anything to do with coming back from Cuba and meeting a certain someone while in Cuba, and I thought, maybe I do want to stick around for a few years that someone turned out to be my future wife. Um, but, in, yeah, those, these first few months at Park Road were, I think, really interesting for me because I think I was, all, I was always really just curious and had a lot of questions. And, and I, I love both the spiritual stuff of, of being religious, but I also love the intellectual stuff and being able to 
sort of ask questions and uh, have doubts and sort of just be in community of, of people who are willing to sort of journey together, maybe never finding an answer. Um, and so, I mean, it's sort of funny because the chaplain at the time, Diane Mowry, who's the one who connected us, had sort of been poking, even when I was at Queens, sort of was poking at me about seminary, and I was like, why would I go study God for my master's? That sounds like a silly idea. And I was very stubborn. If you know me, I'm a pretty stubborn person, and so I had zero interest in that. Um, but as I found that these commu the community could be a place of asking questions and uh, wrestling with some of these difficult topics, I sort of started thinking maybe this is something I do want for my life. And, and I was really interested, actually, the reason I wanted to get my master's, something in diplomacy or peace and conflict or Nordic studies, was because I was really interested in the people aspect, the interfaith pieces, the intercultural pieces. And I thought you could only do that sort of through the, the political avenues and realized actually it's through seminary that you can really do that as well. And so being able to actually go back uh, or to sort of think through seminary and to consider that as an option um, and having these two sort of also poking and prodding and saying, yes, we, uh, we would love for you to go and, and imagining this different journey of, of five years in seminary and all the things that I could possibly do with that was pretty enticing. Um, and then I think also just being at Park Road, uh, going on the Cuba trip, it, it also showed me the ways in which Park Road interacts with the world. And I think that was something that I was also really struggling with was how does the church interact with people outside of the walls in different countries? And I was a little hesitant to go to Cuba because it was a mission trip, but it turned out actually when I um, went and saw, wow, this is just a group of people meeting up with another group of people and respecting each other. I started realizing that maybe this long-term commitment to faith communities is something I want to investigate. You know, we're thinking about your story from rural West Virginia to Park Road Baptist Church and now being the chaplain at Queens University. You've had a pretty interesting journey. Tell us a little bit about that quickly and, and what some significant moments along the way. Very quickly. So, very long story short, seminary was uh, the perfect opportunity for me to sort of step back and, and actually reflect a little bit on the 25 years of my life. I think for the most part, sort of the ways in which I was raised in that community, I just sort of ignored a lot of these theological things that I was struggling with. Um, and seminary sort of forced me to think about what do I believe? And what do I think about God and my relationship with Jesus? And what does it mean to follow Jesus? And what does the church? So all these big questions sort of forced me um, to think about that. Many Saturdays in tears. I'm not a big crier, but let me tell you, the first two years of seminary, I, the amount of times I sat in y'all's office and just frustrated, angry, <laughs> learning all the things um, in tears, it was... It was interesting, um, but I think it was, it was really important because what it allowed me to do was to think about the, the community that raised me and all the things that I appreciate about that and, and sort of looking back and thinking of the significance of my, my grandpa, who was the center of, of faith for me, and being able to appreciate her commitment to faith and and thinking back at my time in you know Pentecostal worship with my grandmother leading music um, and then my grandma actually never cut her hair and so it was always up and really neat uh, in a bun but after most worship services um, sort of seeing her filled with the Holy Spirit the amount of times I would like watch her run around the sanctuary and watching a lot of people running around the sanctuary and falling to the floor and just sort of after service her hair would just be you know a muck and you know to the ground and but just seeing the ways in which that 
that faith grounded her, I think, was really significant for me. And also, uh, community. Community was really important, um, sort of, in my own upbringing. And, and thinking of a significant time for me when uh, one of my older brothers was struggling with drugs and alcohol, and being able, as an eight-year-old, to come up and to an altar call and, and have, like, this whole congregation laying their hands on me and praying for me and and my family was really significant and just learning that community is really important to get through some of the the hard times in life and so so I think you know learning to appreciate but then also looking at the ways in which I struggled um, a, a major struggle for me is I have a lot of questions and and again I'm pretty stubborn and <laughs> I really love dinosaurs. And why can no one explain to me, what, did Adam and Eve live with the dinosaurs? Where were the dinosaurs in Genesis? And this frustrated me so much because I just didn't understand. <laughs> I also didn't understand <laughs> another issue was, you know, when I was sitting in the pews thinking, well, you know, I, uh, all these people are speaking in tongues and being filled with the Holy Spirit and running around and falling to the floor. I was not doing this. And as hard as I tried to sit in this pew as little nine-year-old Joey and force myself to speak in this foreign language, literally just gibbering off things so that I would fit in, you know, I, I think that had a lot of negative effects for me and that I didn't really address until I went to seminary and also, therapy is really helpful as well. To think about all the, the self-negative talk um, that I gave myself for maybe not being quite good enough or, you know, if I had questions, like questions were bad. And so I think seminary was able to ground me in ways that where I could appreciate my past but also sort of be able to let some things go, which was really important. Um, I don't even know. Yeah. Last question. This is, Trans this is Transfiguration Sunday. We read this story that I just read. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> uh, uh, we read this story, and we often hear it, and Christians often read this story, and they think, wow, what a miracle that happened to Jesus. We, we think of this story often just as much about the miracle that happened to the disciples who were changed by Jesus. And so I wonder how you think about the word. When Amy and I talked about Transfiguration Sunday and interviewing somebody, who do we know who has been the most transformed? And we both said, Joey Haynes. How do you think about this story, Joey, and Transfiguration Transformation? So I'll keep it very brief, but when you first said this, maybe I'm, I really am a ba Baptist at heart. To keep it very brief, I actually read the Matthew version of this and not the Luke version. In the Matthew version, it actually talks about um, how fearful that the disciples were, and Jesus ended up coming and saying, do not be afraid. And so I think for me, I think I lived a long time in fear. Um, I lived in certainty, like I knew everything was 100% certain, but yet had so much fear. And I think when I think about being transformed, and just this idea of embracing liberation, embracing a message that is different than what you know, and, and sort of trying to move from fear to freedom, I think has been really helpful for me. And, um, and being okay not knowing everything, and, and also still embracing surprise from this story and being okay to be surprised by new things. We're so grateful for the transformation we've seen in Joey Haynes and for the transformation that he has worked in us and you and for his journey with us. And Joey, thank you for sharing with us this morning. Good to be here. Good luck, Amy.